anything going on out there? <laughs> oh, okay, would you like to say on and we'll start singing. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> yes, there it is. Everybody sign, please. You are holy and you are worthy, so worthy of our praise. And we do praise you, Lord. Father, may your blessings be upon this time that we are together to honor you, to worship you, to praise you, to share your word. Be glorified, great God, in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning to all you. We're going to start singing about the mercies of our Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. We should be singing all day of those mercies. <laughs> okay, you may be seated. seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will 
follow you all of my days. I will seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways. Then step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Hmm. How many of you believe that? Step by step. Amen. Yes. <laughs> How do you describe a love that goes from east to west, runs as deep as it is wide? You know all our hopes, you know all our fears, and words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough. To tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, I would still run out of time. So listen to my heart. Every beat will say, thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, and thank you for the way. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise, a song from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. I'm so glad he hears that from us. tries to hide 
and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands. In his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. He is mighty. He is mighty. Oh, Lord Jesus, how great. Thank you, Father, for all the mercies and the love and the grace you've given us. It's beyond anything we can comprehend but we praise you and thank you, Father, for your presence in our lives. I ask this day be given um, blessings on each one of these people here this day, Lord. Let them feel your presence. Let them feel your goodness. I pray, Lord, that you will be Pastor Rick as he gives us the word. Fill our hearts and our minds with just you, Lord. So I ask this all in the precious and most loving name of Jesus. Amen. How great is our God. You really believe that? Then give me a good, hearty amen. amen. God is great. God is good. Uh, someone told me that Barbara needed a special bulletin, special note-taking bulletin. So we made one up here just for Barbara. Because we didn't want her to miss a word. We have a big print. Just for Barbara. Yes. So she don't have to miss a word. Whoa, I love it. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> need a yeah, need a bigger Bible now. See? <clears throat> Thank you. Now, I, uh, the printer that I had in my office at home went gunny sack on me. Y'all know what gunny sack means? Went up. Gunny bag. Gunny bag, gunny sack, same thing. Yeah. So, so uh, they're going to reimburse me the original purchase price. Of the, and it's two years old because it was under uh, extended warranty. I, I broke down and bought one of those extended warranties, you know. And so it came through for me. So uh, I went down to Office Depot and bought the higher upgraded to the one. And it prints 11 by 17 wow. prints. So, so Barbara, I thought of you and thought, well, listen, we'll just take care of Barbara. She's always complaining about can't see anything. So, uh, room for yeah. Y'all notice that I have a tablet here that I use for my Bible. It, this, it, it, honestly, I'm not playing video games. You know, it does have the Bible on it there and everything. And just to let you know that uh, this is as old as Moses. It is because technically. Moses was the first man to download files from the cloud using a, using a tablet. <laughs> See? He was. So, so uh, I'm right in good company. Good old Moses. Uh, our book of the month, our book, free book for this month. Feel free to take one or a couple if you'd like. It's called Our Daily Bread, Bible Word Search and Activity Book. If you want to learn about the Bible... Man, get in and I got embarrassed on some of these questions that I looked at. I said, I got to look this one up. <laughs> but it's a real good one. It has all kinds of uh, word search, crossword puzzles, uh, questions on who said it, uh, word scrambles, and Bible numbers, and, and more. So f feel free to take one. Uh, that's this month's free book, uh, Compliments of Our church. Uh, Does it have answers in the back? Yes, just for you, Barbara, I asked him to include answers in the back for you so that you could uh, cheat. <laughs> uh, well, we're continuing our study in 2 Peter, and we're in 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the last part of verse 10. Through verse 16. Now, I'd, I'd like you to, to just think about this for a minute. What, what would you say or what would you think or feel if I came up on a Sunday morning and stood in the pulpit and tell you that uh, that Adam was uh, bisexual? You'd call me out on it. You certainly would. Uh, that, that Eve has, as a part of the human race, was already in Adam when Adam was created. What? Yeah. So, so listen to this. Certainly God didn't take one rib and make out of that rib a woman. He took the reproductive segment of a woman we call the gonad or the germ of uh, the germ plasma. He took that reproductive part which was certainly in a side chamber in Adam. What would you say? You'd say that's pretty heretical teaching, wouldn't you? So, yeah, where's that in the Bible? Exactly. So so this now this is coming from from uh, a teacher that, by the way, uh, one of our former members from years ago was really trying to promote this guy and getting people within our church to go up and listen to him because she thought he was the best thing and as a teacher. Listen to this. He says, so I think that Adam was bisexual 
And some of the very early rabbis who were certainly students of the Old Testament had that concept. I'd like to know who they were. He says that Adam was bisexual until God removed the female reproduction system from Adam. And with that, he created the woman. Is that far-fetched or what? He says he took woman out of man. We believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible, the Bible says that God put Adam to sleep and took one of his ribs out of him and created woman. Didn't do anything really fancy or nothing more. I mean, that's simply what he did. Yeah, nothing more. You know, in, in, in the world in which we live today, many things change, don't they? I mean, times change. People change. Weather changes. Attitudes change. However, there are two things that will never change. I've noticed there's two things that never change. The first thing is the inspired word of God. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God says he did something this way, that's the way he did it. And if God says this is a sin, then by golly, we better believe it. It's a sin. We don't want to do it. The other, th the other thing that, does, that never changes is characteristics of false teachers. They're the same. The Bible is God's inspired, infallible, inerrant word. And, and in that, it shows us how we can recognize false teachers. Certainly, we would be able, with, with the teaching of this one that I talked about already, we could certainly right away tell that he was a false teacher. Peter, in this particular passage of section of, of his letter that we're looking at this morning, gives us three uh, unchanging characteristics of false teachers that will enable us to recognize them. You can recognize them by these by, by three things, really. Number one is their arrogance. They think they know it all. Number two is their lavish lifestyle, and, and they're looking down on folk. And number three is their exploitation or their corruption in their teaching. So let, let's begin with the first characteristics that, that Peter identifies, and it's uh, in, chap, uh, in verse 12, the last part of verse 12, or verse 10 uh, through verse 12. You see, false teachers, according to Peter, are presumptuous and they're self-willed. Now that word presumptuous, notice what he says in, in uh, uh, verse 10. He says, in the last part of verse 10, he says, they are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. That word presumptuous there, it means that brazen or insolent, or uh, they're egotistical. And the word self-will means that they're, they're headstrong. They're stubborn. They're, they'll argue with you all day long. They're insubordinate. They will uh, treat you with disrespect, really. Really? in the way they talk about and the way they try to defend what they're, 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 they're teaching. I like this one here. They're pig-headed. 
pig-headed. They're daring and arrogant to the point, as Peter points out, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. That Greek word translated dignitaries refers to a person of glory or honor. Now, the exact meaning here is, is really uncertain. It could be a reference to fallen angels, since fallen angels or demons like fallen mankind would still maintain some of their previous glory and power. You see, in Peter's day, the false teachers were bold. They were arrogant, acting like they were more powerful than fallen angels or demons. Well, in our world today, many false teachers, especially those who promote this prosperity gospel, make millions and millions of dollars casting out evil demons or spirits. Solomon describes the proud and haughty men in Proverbs chapter 21. In Proverbs 21 verse 24, he says, A proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. There are things that false teachers do. Listen, that even righteous angels wouldn't dare to do. Peter explains in verse 11. He says, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a, a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. That word reviling, it means slanderous or injurious. See, false teachers slander and blaspheme fallen angels. But Peter tells us that even righteous angels who are of greater power and might than those of false teachers would not slander fallen angels. How many times have you seen, maybe on television, or I don't know, I've seen it in, in, in person, really, and, and, and also on television, that uh, you, you'll get a, a guy that, that says he's a, he's a prophet from God, he's, and, and he, he is a demon caster-outer, if you will. And he sits there and, or stands there and he is talking to the demon, supposedly talking to the demon and calling that demon all kinds of names and everything. I've heard it and you, you weasel, you slimy thing, get out of that person. Slanderous words against, against demons and spirits. Against Satan. False teachers blaspheme them, but Peter tells us that even righteous angels who are of greater power and, and greater might than those false teachers would not slander fallen angels or demons. You see, angels know this. It's not their place to pronounce judgment because only God is the righteous judge. And he is the only one that can do that. We have an example of that in the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, Michael the archangel, the most powerful angel and, and the chief of all other angels, he had a dispute with Satan over the body of Moses. We read in Jude verse 9, it says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. 
Now, in contrast to that, some false teachers boldly, they arrogantly claim that they have the power over demons. They have the authority over demons. They will claim to have authority and, and demand that they be that cast out of a person calling them those slanderous names. Look, let me tell you something, folks. The only, the only power and authority that we have over demons is through the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not on our own. Not in our own. We had a young man didn't attend our church in, in, in Washington, but he had a ministry aside from our church and, and uh, was kind of asking if they could use our, our church facility to do some teaching. And I, and I checked with his church that he went to and seemed okay. And, and uh, he ha had me involved in uh, this uh, demon possession of, of individuals, which, by the way, I believe it does happen. I believe it's, it is in the world today. It's existed in the world today. And I, I've seen it. I've seen it in people. And I've seen uh, demons come out of, of individuals. And I've seen the change on that person when that happens. But as I was listening to him talk, he said a few things that really got me concerned. And, and then one night when he called me and asked me if I would, you know, mind coming over and being in prayer while he was dealing with this young lady, uh, I said, sure. So I walked in. I, I opened the door and walked in and closed the door behind me. And he chastised me for that. He says, don't you know what you just did? You just opened that door and let some demons in. I said, well, excuse me. I didn't think demons needed to have a door open for them to come in. They, yeah, they need to have a door in our lives open for them because we open ourselves up to them to allow them to come in. But, I, you know... I, and, and he says, well, you, know, you got to be careful because they'll come down the chimney. <laughs> they'll come through that open door. Got to keep those windows closed. They'll come through. I said, dude, those, they'll come through the wall, man. What's wrong with you? That's how some of these guys are. They think they have the authority. They think they all know all about what demons will and do and not do and what they can and can't do. But I got news for you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has the authority to remove demons from a person's life. Amen. And the only authority we have, and, and I've, 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 I'll confess to you, I've, I've been involved in that before. Walked into a room where the young lady was all cowered up in the corner. And she looked at me and had a different face. And this voice came out of her that definitely wasn't hers and said, I know who you are, and I don't want you here. Get out. And I just said, you know what? The only person that's going to get out of here is you because I stand here in the authority and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, I ask him to remove you now. we we got to stand in the authority of Christ, not our own authority, not our own power. It's in the power of Christ. We should never, ever do what even Michael the archangel or any other angels who are greater in power and might than we are, we would, would not even dare to do. Bring slanderous accusations against Satan and his demons. However, we're also taught in the Bible. I want you to grab this. We're also taught in the, taught in, in the word of God that speaking evil and slandering other people 
is a serious sin. You know that? Constantly talking about someone who did something to us or, or that or sl- uh, uh, talking about that's that's a sin. We are told in Titus, listen, Titus chapter 3, verse 2, for example, it says this, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Faithful teachers and pastors have a responsibility to expose false teachers in the church and also to expose the false teachings of God's word. That's a responsibility that pastors and teachers have. And if we don't do that, we're going to be held accountable before God. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to, to say, hey, this person is a false teacher, but now let me tell you why. Why? Because they're teaching this or they're teaching that or they're into this prosperity gospel uh, thing. They're into the, the, the New Age movement. They're, they're into this emergent church movement or whatever. It's our responsibility. And you know what? I, I, I love it when, when, when someone will come to me and say, Pastor, says, I wanna, what about this person? Would, would it be all right to, to, to listen to his teachings and stuff? And I look at him and, and I say, oh, yeah, this guy's really solid right on. Go for it. Or some of them I'll look at and says, whoa, <laughs> stay away from this guy. Now, that's not slandering them or anything. That's just telling the, the fact and truth. And that is exposing false teachers and false teachings like we're supposed to. And then some of them I will even say, you know what? Never heard of him, but I'll research it and I'll let you know. We're to point out who they are and and, uh, why, why they are considered false teachers and also what part of the Word of God they're distorting. Now listen, we're told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Test the spirits. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's why I encourage you Whatever I'm teaching on Sunday mornings or any other time, line it up with the Word of God. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then you need to challenge me on that. You need to bring it to my attention and say, you know, I don't think, where did you get this from, Pastor? That's, that's not what my Bible says. Then we'll talk about that and find out. What does your Bible really say? Oh, well, look at the Bible you're reading. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, read one Bible to the other, they say it a little differently, but it's the same thing, but they're saying it differently. In verse 12, in 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter says this about false teachers. <clears throat> he says, but these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. See, rather than operating from from rational decisions, animals in the wild operate from instinct. They operate from instinct. False teachers like wild animals in a jungle only care about satisfying their appetites, their lifestyle. So Peter says that they are made to be caught and destroyed. Like a wild animal, they can be trapped, they can be be caught, they can be challenged in what they're saying. And, 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 And they're caught that way through 
their eagerness to fulfill their own greedy desires. If you want to trap an animal or something, you entice them with what they really want. It's like James says in, in James chapter 1, verse 14, he says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It boils down to, as the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it's not from God the Father, but from the world. Peter points out in 2 Peter 2.12 that they will be destroyed. God said in, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 30 through 32, listen to what God says. He says, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says... Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord. And then tell them to the people. And cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Peter says that false teachers also, in verse 12, he says, they speak evil of things they do not understand. They claim to have this higher level of spiritual knowledge, but in reality, they really don't understand. This, that, that's what this one teacher, he's, he has this higher knowledge. He's going to tell you exactly how God created woman and, and exactly how what, all that went. And you should, see, you, you should hear some of the other uh, out-of-this-world teachings that he has. I looked up his net worth. You know how much he's worth now? Ten million dollars. Guy has, has, has fleeced the flock pretty well. They, they, they claim to be prophets with, with prophetic utterances over individuals. The Lord gave me this dream, and this is, what he, this is what he says to me to say to you. See, they don't understand the Bible, and they blaspheme God's word and those who faithfully and correctly preach and teach God's word. And of these false teachers, here's what Peter says in verse 12. They will utterly perish in their own corruption. I mean, by, by following their unchecked passions, they will be led to destruction or, or to eternal punishment. They will be destroyed because of their arrogance and because of their pride. Because, you know what? They refuse to humble themselves before God and acknowledge that He is the only one that knows the truth. Solomon tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, that God scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 6, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists those who are prideful, who are arrogant. But when we humble ourselves before God, oh, his grace flows. James also tells us that in James chapter 4, verse 6. And Solomon reminds us in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty or arrogant spirit before a fall. 
The, the, the first characteristic of a false teacher that will a- enable us really to recognize them is their arrogance. I'm not going to name a name. We had a young man like that when I first came to this church. Very arrogant. Was trying to, uh, in fact, he, he actually got a couple of one of our elders and deacons messed up in their theology and, and tried to really divide the church, split the church, and, and, and because of he was bringing in uh, uh, a teaching that was in total opposition to what our statement of faith says and everything. And he was so arrogant that even when we had a business meeting or, or a special meeting so that I could explain to the folks, this is, this is why that I've asked him and his family to leave our church is because of this teaching he's going on. He was so arrogant that he was there and he stood up and he wanted to argue over that. Just give me a few minutes and I'll convince them. I said, God's called me to be the pastor of this church, not you. And I'm saying, you ain't got no place here. I mean, we, we, and we need to take a bold stand and stand for the truth. And that's a responsibility that I take serious. I've got to protect the flock that God has entrusted into my care. Every pastor needs to do that. We need to be teaching the truth and we need to be protecting the flock. That's what, that's what uh, Jesus said when he told Peter, tend my, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And when we tend to them, that means we're protecting them. When they're in the corral, we're at the gate. We're keeping the wolves away. And, and, and we're feeding them the word of God. Good, wholesome food. And so we, 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 we need to take that serious. We need to recognize their arrogance of, of some of these men. And women, by the way. There's some women false teachers out there too. The second characteristic of a false teacher that uh, Peter points out is their lavish lifestyle. <clears throat> lavish lifestyle. Continuing in his letter, Peter explains in verse 13, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Now, the Greek word translated wages, it means pay for services, whether good or bad, pay for services, or or, uh, we could use the word reward. I think in the King James, it may use that word reward. They'll be paid what they truly deserve on their payday. I call that their judgment day. False teachers are guilty of so much unrighteousness that their wage or their reward will be severe judgment. Paul states this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You sow what you reap. Peter continues in verse 13 by saying that false teachers count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. That word translated carouse means uh, luxuriousness or delicate living. The Greek word used uh, there is also used in Luke chapter 7, verse 25, when Jesus speaks of a man dressed in, uh, he says, in soft garments, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury. They have this lavish lifestyle. Many false teachers take pleasure in their fancy personal jets. Their expensive cars, their designer clothing, the, the lavish living that they obtain from their deceit. As I mentioned last week, I think they're called prophets for profit. 
as Peter points out in verse 13, their spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. That phrase, feast with you, uh, could be the, the agape or the love feast that uh, uh, are, uh, uh, that was built around the observance of the Lord's Supper. It could also simply refer to the social contact with the, those heretical teachers. And these false teachers are so self-deceived with their, their drunken carousing at the communion table in, in, in Paul's day that they actually believed they were celebrating their freedom in Christ. Peter says that they are spots and blemishes. They were damaging and destroying the purity of the love feasts. And because of the obsessions of of the false teachers, Peter says in verse 14, that they have eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. That means that they look at a beautiful woman with lust in their eyes. Now, it, don't get me wrong, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me now. It, it's not bad to look at a beautiful lady or or a, a handsome young man and say, man, she's beautiful, but don't linger there. <laughs> don't linger there. It's okay to compliment someone on their beauty. I do that. I, 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 just the other day, I looked at a young lady and I says, you know, you have such a lovely smile. And uh, I have a waitress that comes, and she's always joyful. And, and I would tell her that. I said, you know, I just really enjoy coming here and seeing your beautiful smile and, and how, you know, joyful you are all the time. That's okay. But man, when you sit there and let it go beyond that. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, he says, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's saying these false two, they've lost all moral control. And that's what happens. They have this unquenchable desire for sin and therefore don't stop sinning. Many, many have, uh, that have been in ministry have fallen from grace because of sexual misconduct, uh, misappropriation of, of funds and so forth, and, and have been forced out of ministry. We, we see, we, we, there's some famous, I could name names, and you would know who they were right away. But I want you to understand something. Some men who have been faithful in ministry up to a point and, and, and they've fallen away because of, of getting caught up in a sexual sin or, or their, their greed for finances or whatever, some have fallen, but listen, some have repented, have repented and been restored and are now faithfully serving the Lord. God is a God of grace. And when there is true repentance, then forgiveness is given and restoration is made. That's what, that's what John said in 1 John 1, 9. That's what he meant by that. If, if we confess our sins, if, if we repent and confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. But you know what? It goes on to say, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, he is a God of grace. We repent. We ask God's forgiveness. He forgives us, and he restores us. 
So just because a, 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 a famous preacher or something falls doesn't mean that he can't be restored if there's true repentance in his heart. And by the way, that doesn't mean that if, if, if one falls and he comes up and says, oh, I'm so sorry what I did and I will never do it again. Please forgive me. And he's forgiven and then right away you put him back in ministry. No, no. There has to be a time that he can come under the authority of another pastor or, or leader. And then when it comes that time, yeah, we see that he was genuine and he is really living that lifestyle that he is supposed to be living, then you can start him back into ministry. And I've seen that happen with several of the big name teachers, pastors. So how do false teachers gain their following? Peter says in verse 14 that it is by enticing unstable souls. The word translated enticing, it means to trap, to, to catch with bait. Like fishermen that uses uh, bait to catch a fish. They catch new unstable believers who've not been fully grounded in the word of God by, by teaching what they want what the, the folks want to hear. That's how they entice them to come in. It's, it's it, you know, fishermen will use bait to bring, to real. I, and have you ever, any fishermen in here? Anybody go fishing a lot? Not very many? Where's Jeff? I need Jeff. Oh. Jeff, I need you. You know what chumming means? You know, you go out there and you, you throw this stuff at it and it kind of draws the fish. Then you put the, the bait on the hook and you have the hook out there and they grab at it. And that's the way some of these false teachers they'll teach you what you want to hear. They'll throw that out there. They'll draw you in. They'll make these things that this and one of the things that people are into today now is prophecy. The end time. They're, they're just so hooked. And so when all of a sudden you get this flyer in the mail that says, Prophecy Conference. Come and hear the, about the end times and what's going to happen and what's happening and all that. And, and you say, wow, I want to go see that. Then when you get there, you find out that they're Seventh-day Adventist, is it, that does that one? Or Jehovah's, I think it's Seventh-day Adventist that does that one. Yeah. Then you find out who they really are. And that's the way these false teachers do. They'll, they'll throw that out, draw you in, and then... Because they're teaching what you want to hear. Or at least what some people want to hear. I just want to hear the truth. It might hurt, but I want to hear it. James tells us how people are lured to the false teachings. And that's what he says in, in James 1.14. I've shared it before. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire. We're, draw, we're drawn to them, and then we're enticed by the teaching. Notice that in, in verse 14, Peter says this, they have a heart trained in covetous practices. The Greek word translated trained is the Greek word gymnasio. It's from which we get our English word gymnasium. It meant that like athletes, 
They train, they practice to be good at deception. They, they become experts at deceiving people in order to get their money. Jesus gave a very blistering message to the hypocritical Pharisees and scribes and said that such teachers were like a, a cup and dish that are clean on the outside. And he says in Matthew 23, 25, but inside you are full of of extortion and self-indulgence. You appear nice on the outside. You appear legitimate on the outside, but inside you're just corrupted, full of extortion and self-indulgence. And finally, in the last part of verse 14, Peter says that these false teachers, he says, are accursed Children, accursed children. He is referring to the certainty of God's coming judgment. Remember, remember what, what Paul wrote in Galatians 1.9? If anyone preaches any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. That word translated accursed means eternally condemned. These false teachers and false prophets who distort the word of God, who lead people, uh, God's people astray in order to profit and, and live a lavish lifestyle, will be eternally condemned at the judgment seat of God. So, two of the characteristics that we've looked at, their arrogance, their lavish lifestyle. Now let's look at the last one. The exploitation or corruption. Verses 15 and 16. In verse 15, Peter goes back to the Old Testament for an illustration about these false teachers. He says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam's primary downfall, by the way, was that he, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam, uh, Balaam was a prophet. He became, though, a prophet for profit, or a prophet for hire, if you will, as a result of his greed. And he sold his prophetic powers to that pagan king, Balak, for a promised monetary reward and sought to curse the children of God. Balak was the king of Moab. He paid Balaam to curse the Israelites as they were wandering in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 23, the last part of verse 4 and verse 5, talking about the Moabite says, because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, a Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, I love it when I see that in there. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. But the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. Because the Lord, your God, loves you. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus says, tells us what Balaam actually taught Balak. He says that, uh, that Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. False prophets and false teachers put stumbling blocks before the children of God and cause them to stray from the truth of the word of God. Peter tells us in verse 16 of 2 Peter chapter 2 that Balaam was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. 
God used a dumb animal, a donkey, to rebuke Balaam because Balaam had become so insensitive. God will use, listen, God will use whatever means necessary in order to get our attention and to save us from going down the wrong path. Balaam was heading down the wrong path, and there was an angel of the Lord standing there with a sword drawn, ready to smite him. The old donkey turned another way. Balaam smacked the donkey and started down the path again. And there's that angel of the Lord with that big sword out there ready to smite him. The old donkey ran Caleb into a wall. He got really upset with that donkey. And the third time, the old angel's there getting smited at the end. The old donkey talks to, 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 to Balaam. Can you imagine you doing something and the donkey starts talking to you? I ain't no dumb animal. He's smarter than I am <laughs> then. If he can talk. God used that donkey to keep Balaam from going down that wrong path and and really, he's losing his life to his own demise. False teachers sin so long as their greed and their immort uh, immorality become a form of madness or insanity. False teachers are like the unsaved Gentiles that, that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Spiritual ignorance or, or madness results from being insensitive to God and his word. In fact, the Bible calls that hardening of the heart. When we refuse to listen to God, as false teachers do, eventually what happens, we do it long enough, we develop a hardened heart. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14, Proverbs 28, 14 says, Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. We're also told in Proverbs 29, 1, he who is often rebuked and hardens his neck or hardens his heart, if you will, will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. And Paul warns us over in Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. He says, but, accord, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of, righteous, of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. What are your deeds today? What is your lifestyle like? What you, how do you live your life in the world today? What words do you speak? What words do you speak about other people? Are they negative? Or are they positive? I'll tell you what. You can always find the bad in a person. You can always find... What's wrong in my life and bad about me? But listen, always talk about the good things, the positive things. Look for the positive. Remember I told you that before? Eliminate the negative. Accentuate the positive. We can always, we can always tear people down. But the Bible says that we should let no uncorrupt word proceed out of our mouth, only that which is edifying, which is building people up.
So what happened to Balaam because of his hardened heart, because of, uh, of his actions? Well, during the war between the Israelites and the Midianites, Balaam was killed with a sword. As we're told in the last part of Numbers, Numbers chapter 31, verse 8, if you want to go back and read the story of Balaam in Numbers chapter 31. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with a sword. So Midianites came and they, or the, the Israelites came in and they wiped out a bunch of the Midianites that was fighting against them and everything, and they also got Balaam. In the same way, false teachers will, as Peter states in verse 13, receive the wages of unrighteousness. I think all, all pastors, teachers, church leaders need to take notice. We will reap whatever we sow. If we sow to the flesh, of the flesh we'll also reap corruption. Three characteristics that allow us to recognize false teachers. Their arrogance, their lavish lifestyles, and their exploitation or their corruption. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me... Let me kind of say this to you. In, in, in reading the account of Balak and Balaam, I, I love this because it, 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 it's just like just like the light bulb went off. What do they call it? Having an epiphany or something? Bing! I notice a very important but encouraging lesson that all of us can learn. The Bible says in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven, the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. So listen to me now. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are what your educational level is, what your physical strength is. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past, good or bad. If God can use a donkey to accomplish his purpose, he can surely use you and me. Because according to what Jesus says in Luke 18:27, the things which, which are impossible with man are made possible by God. But I take heart in that. God can use a donkey. He can use me. All right. Maybe we should be singing that song. You can do anything, Lord. You can use me. Use me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, for your words and uh, thank you for the teaching that you're giving us through, uh, through this letter of Peter. And help us, Lord, to be more uh, sensitive to the teaching of your word and, and uh, be more open uh, in, in observing some of those teachers that we may be listening to on radio or television or whatever, and, and really making sure that what they're saying is lining up with your word and, and observe their, their lives. And Father, teach us to be more humble before you. Let us humble ourselves before you, Father. And Lord, as we've seen, you can use anything, anything you want, Lord, to accomplish your purpose. So Father, use us. 
the way you want to use this, Lord, in accomplishing the purpose you have in our lives. We give you honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand together as we uh, sing our closing song. <clears throat> praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,